All right. But you're at home. You're not at the office. I know. Right now, I am at home. Right now, I am at home. Sorry. You are at Michigan University or uh, Michigan State? No, uh, University of Michigan. Hey, Professor Vijay Kumar, it is very, very from our perspective, it's very bad to confuse the two. Oh, I see. Yeah, we we don't think Michigan no, State. No, no. There is a lot of competition between no. the two in sports. So, you know, and my kids who went to school at the University of Michigan would be very upset if you said I'm from Michigan State. Anu? I see. Professor <laughs> Shigan no. is there in yes, Michigan sir. State. Yes, start. Okay, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are, you are audible. Yeah. Uh, very good morning or good evening to Anna and all, whichever is applicable. Honorable Vice Chancellor of CUSAT, Professor K. N. Madhusudanan. Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor of CUSAT, Professor P. G. Shankaran. Distinguished Speaker of the Day, Professor Vijay Nayar. Uh, respected Head of the Department, Professor Rajesh G. Respected Professor N. Balakrishna. All other faculties, professors, research scholars, and my dear friends, warm greetings to all of you. To our great delight, this year, Cochin University of Science and Technology is celebrating its golden jubilee. Over these years, the university has evolved into a prestigious center for academic excellence and research. Today, as part of our golden jubilee celebrations, Department of Statistics QSAT is organizing a lecture on machine learning applications, opportunities, and challenges by Professor Vijay Nayar from University of Michigan. I welcome all of you to the same. We are indeed honored by the presence of our, pro, of our Vice Chancellor, Professor K. N. Madhusudanan, a profound academician and a visionary administrator. I wholeheartedly invite you, sir, to deliver the welcome speech. Distinguished Professor Vijay Nayar, my faculty colleagues, esteemed participants of this event, good day to all of you. Kuchin University of Science and Technology is celebrating its Golden Jubilee this year. As part of the Golden Jubilee celebrations, we have initiated several programs. And one of the most important programs in the series is about inviting eminent academicians and researchers to our campus to give lectures and interact with our students and faculty members also to develop possible future collaborations. Today we have a distinguished professor, Professor Vijay Nair from University of Michigan. Sir, we are extremely delighted to welcome you to Cochin University of Science and Technology through this platform. I'm thankful to you for accepting our invitation and spending time with us. Your experience in statistics and computer science, especially machine learning and its applications, the hot topics which we discuss now. This experience, I'm sure, will give a rich learning experience to all of our faculty members and students. Various application areas of machine learning is expected to be discussed. And our audience can definitely pick up a few for their future activities. I'm sure this will be a big learning experience for all of us. With these few words, once again, thanking Professor 
Vijay Nair for accepting our invitation. Let me conclude. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, we have the most dynamic Professor N. Balakrishna from Department of Statistics, QSAT, to introduce the speaker of the day, Professor Vijay Nair. I welcome you, sir, for the scene. Okay. So, let me give a brief introduction to our uh, guest today, Professor Vijay Nair. Professor Vijay N. Nair is Donald A. Darling Professor Emeritus at University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, USA. He is currently the Managing Director and Head of the Research and Development Group at Wells Fargo Bank in USA. His group in Wells uh, develops advanced statistical methods as well as machine and deep learning uh, techniques for quantitative model development. Before moving to Wells Fargo, Vijay was Donald A. Professor, Donald A. Darling Professor of Statistics and Professor of Industrial and Operation Engineering at University of Michigan, Ann Arbor from 1993 to 2017. He served as Chair of the Statistics Department at the University of Michigan from 1998 to 2010. Vijay was, the, was instrumental in launching the Michigan Institute of Data Science and was recognized as a distinguished scientist by uh, that institute. Prior to joining Michigan, he spent 15 years as a research scientist in the Mathematical Science Research Center at Bell Laboratories in New Jersey. Vijay received his undergraduate degree in economics from the University of Malaya, Malaysia, and his PhD in statistics from the University of California, Berkeley. He has published on a wide range of topics in statistical methodology and inference, engineering statistics, network tomography, reliability, design and analysis of experiments, and quality improvement. His current research interests include risk modeling and machine learning. He has been elected as fellow of American Statistical Association, Institute of Mathematical Statistics, American Society for Quality and American Association for the Advancement of Science. He has served as editor-in-chief of the important journals in statistics, that is International Statistical Review and Technometrics. Vijay served as the president of the International Society for Business and Industrial Statistics during 2011 and 13, 11 to 13. And more importantly, he was the president of International Statistical Institute from 2013 to 2015. You are welcome, Vijay, for this uh, seminar. Thank you, Bala. Thank you, everyone, uh, for the invitation to present this uh, uh, talk on the occasion of the uh, Cochin University Golden Jubilee. Congratulations to the university and the university administration, the chancellor and pro-vice chancellor and uh, also to the Department of Statistics. I have uh, a lot of friends there that I've uh, met and gotten to know over the years. I visited the university, I think three times, and uh, it is one of the, clearly one of the best statistics departments in the country. And uh, the uh, uh, faculty there are doing excellent work. And I'm very pleased to have interacted and hopefully continue to interact with the faculty and students. And so uh, I was told that uh, to keep this uh, presentation some, uh, somewhat non-technical and higher level, and I will try to do that. And uh, again, I, I also wanted to mention that, you know, I am a, I call myself a pseudo Malayali. Uh, the reason I'm a pseudo Malayali is A, I, you know, I was born in Malaysia. My mother is Tamil, my father is from Palakkad. And of course I don't have a mustache. So I've tried over the years to grow a mustache, but my wife has uh, vetoed it. So, so this is part of the reason you can see that I'm not quite a Malayali there yet, right? So uh, let me get started. And I'm going to, uh, you know, unvideo myself. Uh, and, uh, and then I will, start sharing my presentation now. If I am, uh, if you can't hear me, please speak up. And any clarification questions, please raise them. 
as I'm talking. And if you have you know, any deep, uh, deeper questions or will take more time, let's wait until the end of the presentation. I'm hoping for a 45 minute presentation and, uh, and then I'm going to then uh, have time for, uh, uh, I'm going to have time for uh, uh, my uh, uh, questions and answers. Sorry, I'm a little bit distracted here. Uh, let me see if I can, let me, how do I do this? Start video now. Um, now I have to, uh, you're sharing the screen. You can see my screen, I hope, right? Yes, yes, sir. Can you get, uh, no, now we can see. Yeah, I think I have to move my, okay, no. there it is. No, is it, is it the number? Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Can you, can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. Now yes, your first, yes, uh, first slide is visible. Good, I got to hide something, right? So that I can see the full screen. I don't understand how I do this. Hey, don't say anything bad about me in Malayalam because I can understand. <laughs> All right, so I don't quite see how I should do this more. Let me, I'm just, give me a few minutes while I figure out this view thing here. It's, right. it's clear, it is clear. Okay. All right, good. Can you see me? Uh, slides are visible, not you. <laughs> no, that, oh, so, yeah, right, okay. Uh, no, Vijay, then, Vijay, we cannot see you, but we can see your slide, uh, screen clearly. Slide, yeah, the slides are visible. Right, right, right. I'm, I'm trying to move my slides. I don't understand. Oh, there you go, good. Can you see the slides? All right. So uh, what I'm going to be talking about is the general area of machine learning. And my focus will be what we call supervised machine learning, right? And uh, this is a joint work with a number of colleagues at Wells Fargo. And uh, they, I have a team of uh, about 22 people. Many of them are very, just off, right off college. I'm in university with your PhDs. So it's a lot of fun for me to work with them. And uh, so here is an outline, uh, outline of the talk. I'm going to give a very brief presentation and overview of machine learning. And then I'll focus quickly on what is what we call supervised machine learning. And I'll uh, look at two areas. Mostly my interests are in what we call tabular data or what people call structured data. And then I will briefly talk about text data, unstructured data, which is becoming very important. And then I will uh, describe why is there so much excitement and interest in uh, machine learning in terms of the opportunities it presents. But everything comes with its own challenges. So I will then describe the challenges and uh, hopefully we'll have enough time for questions and answers, right? So the uh, let me uh, talk about uh, machine learning and the term artificial intelligence, right? So these two terms are sometimes used interchangeably, but they are quite different from each other. And, uh, but in the lay community, I think they are uh, being used interchangeably. So uh, machine learning is a term that was coined by Arthur Samuel who was at IBM around 1959, and he called it, he uh, said machine learning gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. That of course is rather vague, but it was probably adequate for that time. Perhaps a more uh, descriptive uh, definition would be machine learning deals with the field of the, the studies and constructs algorithms that can learn from data identify important features, make predictions and take actions, right? So that is the uh, perhaps a more modern definition of machine learning, but even this probably is not very uh, apt, uh, but it is a good workable definition. Now machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, right? So we, we confuse machine learning with artificial intelligence, but it is a very strict subset of artificial intelligence, but it's one of the key pathways, key pathways to accomplishing the many different tasks in an artificial intelligence uh, project. 
Now, AI itself is concerned with making computers behave like humans, right? That's really the idea. And uh, my, my sort of uh, uh, joke about that is that the learning is deep, but the intelligence is artificial, right? Because it's somehow we have now come to believe that artificial intelligence is a lot better than natural intelligence, right? In any case, AI, the term was coined by a man called John McCarthy, who was at the time at MIT around 1956. Around this time, there were a series of meetings at Dartmouth in the US, in the Northeast, uh, by a lot of the big names who later on became big names in this field, AI and machine learning. And uh, that's really when a lot of these ideas were developed, initial ideas, and there was a lot of discussion and a lot of development over the years. Now, AI itself has gone through what people call a, a winters, AI winters. There was, uh, it actually has a long history. It started in the 19, probably 40s with a single uh, perceptron trying to mimic, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm talking about machine learning now, sorry. And the AI itself has gone through a lot of ups and downs because people are very, very excited in the beginning, but then they found out that given the computing technologies and state of the art at the time, they couldn't do a lot of the things that we're hoping to do. And it has a long history. Obviously, when you think about what intelligence means, people in philosophy and logic and everybody else have been thinking about it for a long time. Now, within the last, I wouldn't say last decade, this is probably a little bit of an understatement. So within the last two decades, as you know, there's been tremendous advances in computing power, computing architectures, things like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and all of that stuff. And also in, in the advent of big data, right? And so that has allowed people to experiment and try out many different things uh, and so there has been a resurgence of AI, particularly in this area of what we call pattern recognition, right? Image analysis, pattern recognition, and so on. Right? So as I, as I say here, deep learning uh, neural networks are the core of a lot of these uh, developments. So there are a number of different tasks uh, in, uh, associated with uh, machine learning. And so, yeah, just to make sure that everybody, uh, we are on the same frequency, I'm only gonna be talking about machine learning. I'm not gonna be talking about artificial intelligence, which is a much broader topic. Just to understand the difference, you can think about autonomous driving, right? Cars driving independently by themselves. Uh, and so you can think about that. And there are so many different things going on in autonomous driving. And machine learning is just a part of that whole exercise, right? So AI is so much broader uh, than we, I want to keep that in mind. That is one of my pet peeves that people confuse AI and machine learning. What, uh, what I'm talking about today is supervised learning. That is you have a set of data and you have labels, meaning you know, there are the, you know the truth, y is equal to classification problems, y is equal to zero or one, regression problems, you have some continuous response associated with it. And in statistics, we have called them regression and classification problems, right? Now, there are other areas, uh, many other areas, really. Unsupervised learning uh, is a situation where you, are, you have, don't have labels. You just have the X data. And what you're interested in is what is the structure in the X data? Are there any patterns? Are there any anomalies? Are there any clusters, right? And can I also look at the high dimensional data set, can I project, is the structure is really in some kind of lower dimensional space, whether it's a linear subspace or some kind of nonlinear subspace, which people have called manifold learning. Right? Reinforcement learning is another area that is actually, that uses a combination of uh, experimentation and exploitation. Exploitation means optimization. And you have a reward structure and the goal is to learn and optimize over time and in order to identify the optimal decision making. And the reinforcement learning has become very important and very big in a number of different areas. Recommender systems are an example of reinforcement learning. And you all have been following the controversies with Facebook, right? Which has been now recommending what you should see 
after you have visited a number of different uh, Facebook pages. And same thing like Amazon recommends, you know, if you've, or Netflix recommends, if, I, if you watch these movies, these would, other movies would be good, good for you. Uh, a particularly important area where reinforcement learning is becoming useful is what's called precision medicine and mobile health, where people wear uh, what they call smart wearables. And, uh, and then the data is being collected continuously, for, for instance, and uh, 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 researchers are then studying the uh, data from the, from the uh, patient or participant, and they are continuously trying to identify what would be the particular recommendations for let's say health, eating or exercising or quitting smoking would be good for, for that particular person, person and that's called personalized medicine, right? And there are a number of other areas that I've listed below, semi-supervised, representation learning, transfer learning, there are so many other things going on. Everything is about learning these days, right? So uh, with that, let me now uh, move to uh, my topic, today, which is supervised learning. So uh, I want to, before I get into supervised machine learning, I want to talk about the two different paradigms here. Let me just take a minute to see if I can move some of these things off. Um, yeah, good, okay. One second, because it was uh, blocking my screen. Let's see if I can. Uh, all right. Okay. So uh, there are two different paradigms that uh, have emerged in this field of supervised learning. The traditional one is what we as statisticians have been doing for you know now more than a century, right? And the idea is I have a data set at hand, either it was based on an experiment or it was based uh, observational data that I've collected. And the goal is to understand the how, what is the generating mechanism for this data set, right? If I have uh, done an experimentation, then it is clearer. But if I've observed data, uh, observational data, then I want to understand the key drivers of the model. What is the input output relationship? And I want to look at a model. I want to fit them a, a parametric model typically, estimate parameters, assess uncertainty. And, and essentially the idea is that there is some underlying mechanism that generated the data and whatever inference I'm doing would be applicable to that underlying data generation mechanism, right? That's really the traditional view. Now, what has happened over the last uh, 40 years or so Computer scientists, and I'm completely uh, oversimplifying this obviously, were involved in data management, data collections, and, and even engineers, right? They're actually placing sensors and collecting data from different places. And they're sitting with all of this data. And so the question is, why? what would one want to do with this data, right? This huge amounts of data. And so they started looking at how we can use computers or algorithms to analyze this data, right? And so they, their view was, I'm going to let the computers or algorithms do modeling and analysis, and the person doing the analysis is very hands-off, right? So their approach was very much algorithmic, right? And that's, in a way, in a sense, what machine learning really took off, right? And the goal when you're doing this kind of algorithmic modeling is that you really want to get the best predictive performance, right? You want to predict what's going on and you want to make a decision, whether it's prediction, making a recommender system, or predicting whether somebody is going to default on a loan or whatever. And uh, the, the machine learning uh, techniques are aimed at doing predictive performance and not as much as trying to understand the underlying data generation mechanism. Right, So a lot of that effort then went to automation of model building, right? All of the things that we as statisticians did with uh, tremendous work on variable selection, feature transformations and diagnostics and residual plots and all of that stuff was not part of uh, in their radar. They said, we we're just let, going to let the algorithms do the job, right? 
And uh, the other thing that happened is the, is the advent of big data, right? They were use, uh, mostly looking at much larger data sets where they, you could like, don't have to do these very narrow parametric models. And so they were dealing with uh, prediction problems. And so there's not a whole lot of focus on confidence intervals, hypothesis testing, and all of that stuff, right? And uh, so uh, the algorithms that they used, and we'll talk about some of them, right? They are essentially over time have evolved into very complex non-parametric models, which are very hard to interpret, right? And so, so that means that, uh, you know, if you're do, just doing prediction, then interpretation is not an issue, right? Because you're just making a decision in terms of telling a recommender system tells you which book you should read, right? Or which product you should buy, right? But if you're going to make some decisions that, uh, that are, let's say, uh, safety critical decisions, for example, you're driving an auto, auto you know, uh, autonomous vehicle, and there is an accident, you need to understand what went wrong, right? So you need to understand what is going on under the hood, open up the black box, right? So that is, a, there's a lot of research in trying to open up the black box and do both, right? Do both good performance as well as good model interpretability. Now, Bryman uh, in his 2001 paper was uh, partially tongue in cheek said, 90% of the problems we are doing are prediction problems. And that uh, made a lot of statisticians unhappy. Bryman was a professor at, at uh, Berkeley. I knew him, he's passed away now. Uh, and a lot of people unhappy. And so if you go and look at this uh, paper, this article in Statistical Science, there is commentary at the end. A lot of people are pushing back. But I think uh, the, the real, it, it was really a good, very good article. And now a lot of the statistical community is trying to uh, tread water on both sides, both getting good algorithms of predictive performance as well as trying to understand the model, uh, model interpretation, okay? So let me now jump quickly into two kinds of uh, uh, algorithms we're going, we're talking about. And that, well, the first is uh, what's called ensemble algorithms. And ensemble algorithms, uh, special instances are random forest and gradient boosting, right? These are the things that uh, we, we uh, have uh, become very popular. So if you look at this picture here on the left, traditionally what we do is, uh, the traditional model fitting approaches is that I have a set data set, right? I fit a model to the data set, uh, this step here, I take the entire data set, I fit a model, typically a parametric model, right? And so here is my fitted model. And then if I get a new observation, a new uh, uh, problem, a new, uh, so let's say customer coming in and I apply my model and I get my prediction and there I am, I'm done, right? Of course, when I fit the model, there are a lot of diagnostics and everything else goes on. But what uh, has happened with the on, uh, ensemble algorithms is that instead of fitting a single model, what you do is that you split your data, uh, you, you have multiple data sets, right? You have multiple data sets. So you, uh, and I'll talk about examples of that. And you train algorithms on each one of these data sets, right? So you have, let's say you have K data sets. I have an example of three here. And so you have three different models on three different data sets. And then you combine them somehow, right? You combine them. And the idea here is that this ensemble algorithm would do better than a single algorithm, right? And that has been shown to be true in uh, machine learning in a lot of applications over the last, uh, gosh, 30, 40 years or so, right? So that's really what an ensemble algorithm is. What is bagging? Bagging stands for bootstrap aggregation and random forest is a special instance of that. And that's a paper by Bryman and his student Cutler in 1994. The idea is that all of you, or many of you may be familiar with uh, regression trees where you fit a piecewise constant regression model, right? So if you fit a piece constant, a single tree, right, the, the problem with a single tree is that especially if you go deep down in a tree, it, is, uh, it fits the model well, but it's very unstable. If you change the observations a little bit, 
your partitioning will change a lot and your model predictions can also change, right? So what Bryman proposes is of fitting a single deep tree, you fit many deep trees and you average them, okay? So what you do is that you take the data set, from each one you take a bootstrap sample, okay, of that data set and you fit a tree. Another bootstrap sample, you fit a tree, another bootstrap sample, you fit a tree and so on. And typically you do about hundred of them. And, uh, and then you take the average, right? That's really the fitted model. So it turns out that building, you build many trees that each individual tree has small bias because it's deep, but the variance is large. And, uh, but then you average to reduce the variance, right? Now boosting is another idea, completely different one. And it was actually the original idea is due to a man called Shapir who was at Bell Labs in the computer science group when I was uh, there. And uh, he is now at Princeton, and they created this technique called adder boosting. And then, and then Bryman showed that boosting or uh, uh, is really an instance of uh, uh, gradient optimization. And so that led Jerry Friedman at Stanford to come up with this gradient boosting algorithm, right? So in the gradient boosting idea is that you take you you take the data set, you first fit an overall mean to the data. And then you take the residuals, you take the residuals from the overall mean, and then you fit another tree to that, okay? And then you take the next set of residuals and you fit another tree, right? You keep on doing this. And so the idea in gradient boosting is to fit trees to residuals sequentially, right? And then at the end of the day, and, and it, and it uh, based on Bryman's uh, result, you can show that these updates, fitting, updating results sequentially, is in the direction of the negative gradient. So you're really optimizing a loss function. Now the trees that uh, Fry, uh, Friedman suggested is to fit short trees. The reason for fitting short trees is you have low variance, and, but there is big bias, but by boosting, which is fitting residual sequentially, you can address the bias, right? That's what the subsequent, over time, the sequentially they address the bias. So boosting reduces, that's the typo here, boosting reduces bias, okay? So that, those are the two major algorithms that are now used based on trees. There are other kinds of ensemble approaches, which I'm not going to mention, uh, get into. Now, the other law, uh, major uh, class of algorithms is based on what's called neural networks. And what I'm showing you here is just feed forward neural networks. Uh, over the last uh, 20 years, there are many, many more complex networks they call deep neural networks, right? So let me just give you a quick overview of what is going on in neural networks. And as I said, the idea here is, uh, goes back to 1930s and 40s. And the word neural network, as, as the name suggests, is an attempt to make, mimic it, your brain or what is called neuronal networks, right? Your neurons firing in your brain. It is sort of a mathematical, abstraction of what happens in your brain. So you have a neuron and the nearby neurons and each one of them are connected to this neuron and when they fire, all of them fire and this neuron you know, gets all the stimulus and if the combined stimulus exceeds some threshold, then it fires, right? This neuron will fire, right? That's a very naive, completely oversimplified way of what happens in real life, right? But what I wanted to emphasize to you, the components here is that in, in our applications with data, you have input data, X1, X2, X3, all the way to X50 or whatever, right? These are things. And each one of these observations is weighted, right? With, by weights and they are added up, which is this W transpose X. And then some activation function is applied, G of W transpose X. And that's really what goes to the next stage, okay? So if you look at this, and these activation functions are sigmoidal, hyperbolic time, and the most common one is called ReLU. And uh, as, if you can look at this and stare at it, statisticians have looked at, seen this long time ago, and that is what's called projection pursuit or additive index model, which is additive, right? And uh, in many variables, and then you're applying a nonlinear function, right? That's called an additive index model. Now, the uh, feed forward neural network in its full glory consists of an input layer, an output layer, and many hidden layers, many, many hidden layers possibly, and many, many neurons. And each one of these, neuro, uh, in the, each one of these neurons gets input from all the X's and they all are connected to all possible neurons over here. 
and you know, and the number of layers and number of neurons are called hyperparameters, and they are optimized, right? Uh, optimized as part of model training. Now, uh, more recently, now the term deep uh, neural network has become uh, a little bit abused, right? Everything is deep these days, right? There's something called deep regression, deep least squares, and you know the, the term deep has become uh, abused, I think. But deep uh, neural networks refers to two classes. One is you have many, many layers this way. And then you also do uh, not, not just feed forward, but you do CNN, which is convolutions, recurrent, long short-term memory. And there are also things called BERT, transform, uh, transformers, and so on, right? So there are many kinds of things going on in neural networks these days, right? It's very, very active research area. Now, what I want to give you is that I, I'm not uh, able to do a good job in giving you the, uh, the breadth of applications out there, but since I'm currently working in a bank, I will give you some ideas of what goes on in a bank. So in a bank, and I write, uh, right now work in a bank called Wells Fargo. It's a large uh, bank and our, the business is mostly loans, mortgages for houses, uh, loans for uh, cars, automobiles, credit cards, small business loans, big commercial banking loans, and so on. So one of the big thing we have is credit risk. Are people going to pay the loan or not, right? So we have to predict those, uh, those losses and we do, and that is one of the major efforts, right? What is the, based on our historical data on uh, people having mortgages, auto loans and so on, what is the history and based on the histor historical data, we want to be able to predict, you know, uh, typically we do uh, 39 months ahead. Uh, that just seems to be the industry standard, don't ask me why. And then credit decisions, right? Who gets the loan, who doesn't get the loan, how much, uh, who do we market the products to, when somebody doesn't pay the law, and what do we do? How do we go about collecting it? All of that stuff is again model, right? These are all individual models. You have thousands and thousands of models for each particular product line. In mortgages, we have many, many different mortgages, many, many different auto loans. So there are individual models for all of these things, right? Another area I want to point out is financial crimes. Fraud is a big part of, unfortunately, everyday life. So there are fraud by customers and employees, right? We got to detect that. Money laundering is a big problem. You all know that, uh, I don't, oh, I, I can't talk about India, but in the US, if you uh, transfer uh, a wire transfer of more than $10,000, it automatically, uh, a, a, a trigger is sent, an alert is sent to the IRS, in, Inland Revenue Service, Internal Revenue Service in our case. But what if somebody is cheating and sends uh, two, uh, two uh, wire transfers of $9,000 or $9,005 and you know, $8,007, right? Because people, you know, you can be a clever fraudster, right? So, so all kinds of things going on there. And then the more recent one is text and speech where you have data from conversations with employees and I mean, customers and our, our employees that consider complaints and emails and voice messages. We are now looking at chatbots for assisting customers, uh, making transactions and employees looking for uh, information. Wells Fargo has 250,000 employees. It's a large company worldwide, right? And I've listed some of the statistical techniques that we've done, uh, we've been using in the past. Uh, you know, we do from very basic to uh, very advanced statistical models semi-parametric, non-parametric, time-varying coefficients, right? We do uh, regularization like lasso and ridge. It's a very standard survival analysis, which is really what credit risk is, whether somebody is going to pay a loan or not. These are all big, big issues, uh, big, big areas for us. But more recently, over the last 10 years or so, we've moved into uh, increasingly into supervised machine learning, Partly, and I'll talk about the reasons why. And the particular ones I've talked about is random forest, gradient boosting, and neural networks, right? In the computing environment, people used to use SAS in the old days, and you know R, which is open source. Python is now becoming big, and C and C++ is really big for large scale problems, right? And we work with CPUs and GPUs, graphical processing units, right? These are the uh, very very fast uh, for, for especially for parallel processing. Right? Okay, now let me give you a quick example. Uh, Bala, you need to tell me how much, or somebody, Bala, you need to tell me how much time I have. 
Yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to skip this example. I was going to talk to you about an example, but I just want to give you a quick uh, comparison of the different techniques on an application that I don't have time to get into. But as you can see, this is something uh, you know comparing different algorithms, right? Which is logistic regression, logistic regression, gradient boosting, random forest, and feedforward neural network on a particular data set. It's a one million observations. We had 22 predictors, and this is something called ROC curve, and you want the curve to be as high, high as possible, and AUC is area under the curve, and you can see that the logistic regression is about 0.83, and you want this to be as large as possible, and you can see these machine learning alg algorithms have improvements of about uh, 3% to 4%, right? Or even higher, right? So this is a big deal. You might say, think that this is not a big deal, but this is a big deal when you're making decisions, particularly in some areas, right? So this is the kind of improvements in predictive performances you get with, uh, with machine learning techniques. In some cases, much more, in some cases, much less, right? And uh, now, let me now get into natural language processing a little bit, right? Because my goal here is to be broad rather than deep, okay? So um, natural language processing refers to these broad classes of methods and algorithms and even systems or devices for, um, for analyzing and modeling that human language, right? Text, speech, conversations. And as you can imagine, this is a very, very challenging area just because, you know, just anybody who has tried to learn a foreign language can understand how difficult it is to, to learn how to uh, speak and uh, even write in different languages, right? And to automate that whole thing is really, very, very challenging. And uh, you know there has been a lot of uh, gains, but there has also been a lot more work that needs to be done. So this is an interdisciplinary area that combines computer science, statistics, and optimization, and a lot of different areas. Uh, they, it used to be called computational linguistics. I remember this in the 1980s, uh, right after I had graduated. And when I was at Bell Labs, speech recognition was a big, big area that Bell Labs and IBM were the two big players in trying to understand and recognize speech. And you can imagine the applications when a, a pilot is landing a plane, you know, and we have this ad traffic control people, right? So can we replace them by robots, right? And, uh, you know, the, the speech recognition accuracy is not good enough for such safety critical applications, but it's certainly good enough for things like Siri and Alexa and a lot of the things that we have in the smartphones, right, these days. So uh, the, uh, the techniques have evolved from rule-based to statistical, and now they're largely driven by deep neural networks. And this is one area, these, uh, in, in addition to image analysis and in large-scale pattern recognition problems where deep neural networks have really, really done much, much better. In computer vision, for example, there's a lot of uh, people who do computer vision, but these algorithms are beating the heck out of uh, deep neural networks according to uh, people I've talked to, right? Now, I don't know anybody, any of you are aware of this program called Jeopardy in the US, right? And that uh, there, was a, there was a competition between the uh, two top guys who won, two, the, you know, won millions of dollars on Jeopardy and a, a, an algorithm called uh, IBM Watson. IBM developed uh, IBM Watson, and this was a robot, really, an algorithm answering questions. And uh, you know, and so what? Ha what is involved here, right? It's what's involved here is uh, Alex Trebek, who was the host, asks the question, and the algorithm or the a computer or whatever we want to call it has recognized the question. Go and search in its vast database quickly retrieve the right question and then you know speak right or, or voice it out right so that's really the the issue and the big advantage IBM Watson had is of course it has huge memory infinite memory almost right so IBM Watson you know beat uh, the top players right so that was an instance of NLP elements of NLP in there but the applications are I mean I've just listed a few things right summarizing text I have a whole bunch of long text and I want to just summarize it automatically using algorithm into some real important elements machine translation translating let's say here is uh, is French to English 
And it's just not a word for word translation because you got to take the translation and put it back into gr proper grammar in a way that somebody can read and understand, right? And then text classification is classifying a text into a particular things. For example, is that related to technology or is it sports or is it entertainment? This is a big application in the bank because we got to look at our communication with the customers and classify them in whether it's complaint or not. And if it's a complaint, what kind of a complaint, right? Sentiment analysis is again, another big thing, whether you look at uh, some kind of uh, conversations going on and you want to classify that into different sentiments, right? And the more, more uh, new ones are chatbots like Alexa and Siri. And one of the things, as I mentioned, is that we are now moving into conversational AI with our customers in the bank, where they will uh, call and ask us uh, to, to move money from one, uh, one account to another account. And that involves uh, money. So we have to understand and make sure that the, what people are saying is correct. And, uh, and we have to make sure there's enough money and we got to move it. So we are still not at the stage where we can actually handle those kinds of money related conversational AI, right? And natural language generation, in addition to processing data, you want to generate text. That is a very challenging area and a lot of work going on in there, right? So now I was going to get into a lot of different things here about this and I'm, I'm not going to uh, get into a lot of details. Let me just quickly go through what is a typical workflow. The workflow in NLP depends on the problem, of course. Here is an example of a text classification problem where you want to classify uh, a corpus of data into uh, complaints and types of complaints. So you have to train this algorithm. So you have an existing corpus of data, right? With uh, labels that uh, you know are correct and that's typically manually developed. So you have to look, do, I mean, like always, you do, uh, even if you have to do EDA to look at whether missing data, some anomalies and all of that stuff. And then comes the NLP part, right? Which is, you have to pre-process the data into, you know, because the data has a lot of spell check problem, check problem punctuation, what do you do with it? Lemmatization, tokenization, these deal with, for example, you might have the same word like likely, like, uh, likely, likelihood, I'm not sure about likelihood, but you know, you got a whole bunch of variations of the same word and you got to, you know, uh, you got to uh, take, take a lot of those things out and, and simplify them, right? And then you got to look at where this one sentence ends and one sentence be begins, right? So a lot of stuff goes on there. And then after that, you got to figure out how do I take these texts and how do I con convert it into numerical data, right? So for example, unigram is single word, like word or single. Bigram is two words, single word, right? But it is part of speech tagging. So a whole bunch of things goes on here. And then you, once you identify these features that you want to work on, you convert them into numerical data and the big, big uh, development circle in word embedding, word to vec, you know, con converting uh, words into numerical uh, data. And this is typically very high dimensional. And that's really where the problem is, right? Because you have uh, 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 the, the data coming in, which is very large in terms of number of words or number of biograms. And then the word embedding is also very high dimensional. And so that makes the training uh, problem a big one. And that's why you need deep, uh, people are using deep learning neural networks, right? So this, this is really where the machine learning part comes in. And then once you have the model, you deploy it, you monitor it and so on, okay? All right, I'm going to skip this slide. I'm going, I have sent the slides, my slides to Bala and he can circulate to anybody who's interested. We have done a lot of work uh, comparing different algorithms. There's also work in the literature, which algorithms are good for what situations, right? And uh, what I want to now talk about is what are the opportunities and challenges, right? So, uh, you know, the term big data was a big uh, fad, right? Big, uh, Big uh, 20 years ago, 20, last 20 years and data science and you know, a whole bunch of activities related to that. We don't hear big data anymore. Even data science is uh, fading out. Now everything is AI and machine learning, right? So these are to me are very faddish things, but we do live in a world of fads, right? And we just have to adapt. 
So, uh, but big data, what, the, one of the things about the big data is that we identify that we realize that there are all these new sources of data that have lots and lots of information that we can tap into. So for example, social media, right? Social media uh, has lots of chatter, of course, that is related to, you know, uh, under, unrelated to, uh, to things that companies may want to do, but there's also a lot of information that is, goes on. For example, in the US at least, if you want to understand, uh, estimate unemployment, which direction is unemployment uh, indicators are going, you have to wait for uh, what people call uh, claims, unemployment claims. People make claims when they, are, when they are laid off. And then depending on how people make claims, you uh, then based on that, you estimate what is the unemployment statistic, what unemployment statistics are. But that takes time, three months, six months, right? However, if you are looking at Twitter, right? Or Instagram or whatever, I'm not into all of any of those stuff. There's a lot of chatter going on People saying, I've been fired, I've been laid off, I got the pink slip, I'm doing that, I'm doing that, right? So that's a lot of sort of what we call timely data, right? So instead of, the, the term people call it, uh, instead of forecasting, the term people use was now casting. Now casting means I, things are happening now and I want to understand what's happening now, right? And that's a lot of information, social media about that sort of stuff. So my colleagues at Michigan, used, uh, showed an example of uh, scraping Twitter data. There's a lot of uh, data cleaning you have to do and showing that the Twitter information uh, uh, conversations have tremendous amount of information on uh, things like uh, unemployment statistics or even things like, uh, for example, if there is an, a flu epidemic coming on, you can track to see if people are uh, talking about, you know, uh, flu, they're you know, talking about going to the uh, pharmacy. So there are lots and lots of information that can be tracked in order to identify trends. Okay? The problem with those data is, as you know, they're not, they're very biased, right? Because they're not representative of what's going on. People who do use Twitters, in social media is a bias subset of the population. So you cannot take, get representative information on that, right? It is biased. However, it, you can capture trends going up, going down. Those kinds of informations can be captured on social media. Same thing like, you know, you're driving, you find a pothole. And if you're connected through some kind of a network, you know, you can tell people where the, where the potholes are and that is now being deployed in Europe, for example. And you can talk about, you know, where the traffic jams are and so on, right? So a lot of stuff going on, in particular, texts and conversations are another important source of, of, of uh, new information. And so, so uh, together with big data, at the same time, we have had tremendous advances in computing and data storage. Those of you who are in computer science, computer engineering fields, and other engineering fields uh, know much more about what's going on in this space than I do. You know, it's so much easier to, with sensors to collect data, data you know, warehousing, transfer management, cloud storage, cloud computing, scalable algorithms, things like PyTorch, TensorFlow for analyzing big data. And a lot of these things have become open source, right? So, so all of these, all of these have led to what people call democratization of data science, right? People have access to algorithms, have access to data. You can do, do your own you know, data analysis, modeling, what have you, right? Okay. Now, specific to, to machine learning is that, you know, because of the much larger data sets, we don't have to do restrictive parametric modeling, right? So we can actually be use much more flexible modeling, complex non-parametric algorithms. And that's really uh, what uh, this, this uh, uh, onslaught of uh, techniques and su supervised machine learning. So this very flexible complex modeling means that we have much better predictive performance. In addition, using algorithms or computers to do the training means that you can automate feature engineering, you know, how, which variables are important, which variables, how should I transform the variables? I don't have to do all of that manually, which is what statisticians have done. And you have large P like 100 or 1000 variables, these kinds of feature engineering and model training is very, very intensive, right? So, so these algorithms are really geared towards large data sets, right? 
And as I said, new, new sources of data, right? Which allow to more timely information and decision making. Challenges. Right? So uh, the challenges are the algorithms are complex, right? And because they're so complex, you can't write it down. There is no analytical expression. What you have is you, I give you an X, an input, new input. You can give me what the predicted value is, right? But you can't tell me how you get the predicted value because that is a very complex uh, you know, object, right? Which is in a, in a computer, right? So how do I unwrap that? How do I unwrap that is the issue. So I'm gonna talk very briefly about interpretability in the next few, next slide. And I, I know Bala is, uh, uh, we need to stop and, and try to get some questions. The other issues are fairness and bias. This is very much, very much on the minds of a lot of people these days, right? Because you let algorithms do their thing, you don't really know what happens under the hood, right? So one of the things that the algorithms do is that they take data and they, you know, and the predictions hug, hug the data very closely. And we know data historically has a lot of bias, right? Historical data have a lot of biases, right? Because in the US, for example, we are very concerned about, uh, you know, the criminal, how, how the police are, are dealing with uh, different racial groups. And you look at data, uh, past data, there's a lot of, you know, their data is inherently biased, right? And then algorithms, if you let them learn from the data, they're going to be even very biased, right? So they're, they're biased due to data, they're biased to the fact that these are very complex, non-parametric algorithms are, bit, are far too flexible, right? So that's a big area, how do you deal with that? And then there are a whole bunch of things here, I'm gonna to touch on this very quickly. All of these algorithms have hyperparameters, right? And especially deep neural networks have millions, millions of hyperparameters, right? And these are being tuned and tuning them uh, takes a lot of time. And you can also ask yourself, what does it mean when, a, when you have a model with that many number of hyperparameters? Is that really a model, right? If, you know, you, we all know about uh, control theory where you have to turn a knob to, to adapt to something, but this may be too flexible, right? And then the stochastic nature of the algorithm, because all of these algorithms are random, right? You start out with some random seed, and so your algorithm converges to some result. But if I change my random seed, my, I might get different answers. So how, how much variability are those in the answers, right? So all of these things are problematic. The other thing that I want to uh, mention quickly is that when you have huge data sets, you, it's very, very hard to do model diagnostics and it's very, very hard to do visualization. You can't visualize the results when you have 100 uh, dimensional predictors, right? And there's not enough work on this area, right? In terms of dynamic and interactive visualization. That's an important, interesting area. Okay, I'm gonna skip all this. Uh, what, I, what I wanted to mention is that there are, there are interpretability, what I call unwrapping the black box, looking under the hood. How, uh, what does this model do? There are a number of different approaches. One is called post hoc techniques, which is techniques to explain the results after the model is fed, right? So, and there are these games. Hello? Can somebody mute, please? Okay. So, post hoc techniques, right? There's a big class of techniques there. The other one, um, the other class is surrogate models, right? You once you fitted a model, a complex model, okay, you you take the fitted values of the complex algorithm and you refit a simpler uh, uh, interpreter model. The reason for use uh, first fitting uh, a complex algorithm is the fitted values are more stable, and so fitting a simpler algorithm on the fitted values is, you know, tends to give you more stable models, right? So these are surrogate models. And, and we have a paper on that called surrogate model-based trees. Bryman has something called born again trees. And there's something called Lyme is very, very big in, uh, in, uh, in some areas. And the third class of models is what we call inherently interpretable models. These can be, for example, models that are things like models with many facts and lower order interactions, because you might believe, and it turns out to be true that most of the action is in many facts and second order, third order interactions. And you can estimate these things non-parametrically, right? And this idea is not new, but what is new is a lot of uh, new algorithms to estimate 
you know, uh, when you have, let's say 20 predictors, of 50 predictors, you want to estimate main effects and low order interactions and make sure that these things are orthogonal and post-processing them, there's a lot of work on that. And this is all about algorithms, it's all about algorithms. There's a, there's a technical EBM, extended uh, boosting machine in Google. And we have something called uh, GAMI tree, generalized identity model with interactions based on trees and neural networks, okay? So, and we also have something called local linear models and locally generalized identity models we are working on. Now I'm gonna skip that, right? So here, summary. Let me just uh, finish with a few points. So the, the advent of big data and all of these advances in computing, and I mean computing more generally in terms of data collection, data warehousing, uh, you know, data transfer and all of those associated things, not just programming and not just open source algorithms have presented us with many, many opportunities, right? The world now is not the world in which I graduated in 1980, right? Around 1980, it's a different world. And there's so many things going on for people who are young, young students and young graduates, right? Now, one of the things uh, related to my particular presentation here is that the machine algorithms are really, really good at, uh, are tailored towards large data sets, develop flexible models, which provide you much better predictive performance, automated feature engineering, which is very, very good for large data sets. So you don't have to worry about should, which variables are important, uh, how do I transform those variables? Should I worry about interactions and all of this stuff, right? And then there's also all of this stuff going on about new sources of data, in particular in our space, text data uh, conversations are very becoming very big, right? I've already identified a number of challenges there, right? Computational challenges, even though there are advances in computing, is still you need access to very fast scalable, you know, very fast uh, machines like GPUs, graphical processing units, and uh, you know, and people, uh, and you got to spend a lot of work on on data and machine engineering. People talk about data science, and I've said this be before. Uh, you know, seventy percent of data science is data engineering, and by engineering is really very simple uh, in what what one might call custodial work, like a janitor cleaning up stuff. Right, it's a lot of stuff goes on. Right, so nothing is easy. The other thing about these machine learning algorithms is that they're too data oriented, but often they are not consistent with subject matter knowledge. And how do you do that, right? That's a big area for us. And we're also looking at the usefulness of causal discovery, causal discovery methods, uh, because may, we have so many variables, but some of them are, are being caused by others. So there's a lot of crosstalk among the variables, right? You throw all of them in, the predictions are not very, interpretations are not very good. And I've already talked about interpretability, fairness, and bias, okay? So I was going to talk for 40 minutes, but I've talked much more than that. So let me stop here. And I thank you for the opportunity again. Uh, thanks to Bala and also to the vice chancellor and pro vice chancellor. And, and I appreciate all of you attending. And uh, I'm very happy to take any questions. Hello, Question. the forum is open for discussion now. The participants may ask questions, if you have any specific questions about the talk today. Any questions? Um, hi, good morning, sir. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, uh, I would like to ask you a specific question. Uh, about the machine learning in the in the banking data set, uh, because yeah. uh, I have worked on a very similar project. Because uh, the the data that I got from uh, was from it was an open source data from the internet, uh, mm -hmm. but the problem that I faced there was it was heavily skewed. Uh, so modeling such data was very challenging for 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 me. Yeah. And but now uh, currently I'm doing my PhD. Now I am having a much more bigger challenge because uh, it's a very uh, highly zero inflated data set. It's like almost 99% of data is like zeros. Uh, so for this, you know, the techniques that I, I know is like, you know, uh, take the undersampling or or, 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 or oversampling or these um, uh, smoothing techniques. Uh, but do you have any other kind of, you know, uh, techniques that are very effective in this, uh, uh, like the, uh, heavily skewed uh, data sets or the zero inflated da data sets? Yeah, I think I, I don't, uh, you know, the highly skewed data sets, 
Uh, actually, that's a very good question because uh, the machine learning people don't seem to worry about all the things we worried in modeling, right? Your, your predictors are very heavily skewed. Should I transform them before I you know, fit the model and all that? To some extent, this automated feature engineering takes, takes care of them, but it doesn't do a sufficient job, right? There's a lot of potential for research. Now, your second question is what uh, is called imbalanced data in the, in the field, right? So when you have, a, let's say, a classification, uh, you, you're looking at fraud, and the fraud is whether uh, the people are, are uh, doing fraud or not fraud. There are very few people who do fraud, so the number of uh, ones is very small, right? Sometimes it's one percent or point zero one percent or whatever, right? That's that. Is that what you meant? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's you know as you already know the literature, right? People do undersampling or oversampling or waiting, and so undersampling, oversampling is re, uh, closely related to waiting, and uh, you can do that. And also, you're going to be very careful about the loss function, right? Because if you have a loss function, uh, you know you can classify uh, a bad loss function. You can classify all the ones or zeros because ninety nine 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 percent of the data is zero, so you know your accuracy is not that bad. So, so you got to worry about your last function. Now, uh, what I suggest is that you get my email through Bala and connect with me. I have a research team project right now. I have a, a, a several people working on, on just that idea right now to look at uh, you know, what, or what are the different things, how good are these techniques, are there, are there other things that we need to do, right? So it's, it's actually a long discussion and I'm very happy to connect with you offline. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. any, any other questions? Um, Vijay sir, this is Shana again. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I just have like a specific question related to health analytics. Mm. Um, we collect the data over the time. It's maybe like a 10 years uh, data sitting there and it's like a month to month data and aggregated at the organization level based on different indices. Say for example, is the waiting time in a hospital or maybe um, mobility or uh, like mortality. And at the same time, some of the data are just like um, the clinical indices in the sense of false rate. It's coming at the implementation site level in the sense unit level, maybe like, like from medicine unit or medical surgical unit. So the aggregation of the data itself is in different tire, we would say, and the data is sitting there um, and it's time series. So what happened is, is like uh, some of the data, especially for false rate, like clinical data, they are for certain period only, but the organizational approach is just like uh, sitting there for longer time. The data is like a continuous collection. So the challenge right now sector specific challenges as well as some of the data set that are coming in different layers. So do you have any specific suggestions uh, for any type of machine learning um, or I think like a neural network is the one we are working on right now, um, but more specifically, if the aggregation and if the data collection structures differs. Yeah, Shano, I think that's, you know, machine learning is not going to solve those problems. Okay, it's not, right? Because, you know, you 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 get throw the data in, it says, you know, I mean, unless you uh, uh, enforce the structure of the data somehow, either through your loss function or whatever, right? It's not going to know, right? It's an algorithm, right? It, 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 it takes your data. Even for time series data, if you use GBM without enforcing the time series structure, it won't work, okay? So for, you know, so you got to think about how do you deal with time series, right? And so neural networks, and there's a whole area called attention and self-attention where that for dealing with time series data, right? So, so the, you know, and then you, you have all kinds of hierarchical models, clustering and all of that stuff. Machine learnings are too, are not right now sophisticated, the techniques are not sophisticated enough to handle them, okay? So what you need to do is really, uh, you know, if you're missing data, you have, you have all of that stuff, you, you know, you, you are not ready to use machine learning is, what, is my point, right? So no, you, you can't. And especially if you have, you know, small data sets, right? Unless you have data sets in the 
at least tens of thousands at least, right? Or hundreds of thousands. That's really where the bank for the buck comes in because you can't really use very complex, you know, complex non-parametric models with thousand observations, right? And five predictors, right? You, you, can, you can handle that with your regular models, right? So but my own view, and people may disagree, is that there is not a lot of scope of using machine learning in, in with small data sets, even moderate data sets, right? And we have found that the lift or the improvement is not that much, right? In fact, it can be worse, right? But more importantly, the question you're saying is, how do I deal with all of these complexities with the data before I even start modeling, right? And that, that is no, machine learning does not provide an answer to you, okay? Now, what I, what I can, you know, what, if you'd like, you can reach out to me, right? You can reach out to me through my UMich address, right? Unison Michigan address. And we can we can chat, right? So I understand a little bit more, right? And I can tell you, you know, what what are the techniques that are available, right? But it, it is true that if you have anything but independent, you know, most of the loss functions people use are uh, sum of squared errors, log loss, or things like that, right? Assumes implicitly assume they're independent. So time series data, you know, they they may not necessarily do a good job, right? It's it's a field that is still very very open, right? I, I'm sorry to be, to, to be so disappointing, but that's reality. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. For your yeah, the other thing I wanted to mention, Bala, if you have time is, you know, there is a lot of effort in this field to automate everything, okay? Automate machine learning, right? So what they would do is even go further, right? Because people are becoming very lazy, right? We know, and we don't want to really do anything. We want to push a button and get an answer, correct? That's the world we live in, right? And so there's a lot of effort in, you know, I don't know if any of you have uh, participated in Kaggle competitions, Kaggle, K-A-G-G-L-E, K-A-G-G-L-E, look it up, right? These are competitions where people, you know, like Netflix had a competition about, gosh, about 10 years ago, it's a million dollar prize to see who can come up with the best recommender systems. Their recommender systems are for, you know, what movie should I watch after I watch all these movies, right? So it's very personalized to you, right? So these kind of competitions are aimed, you know, what people do is that they take these variables and they take ratios, they take sums, they take uh, differences, uh, multiply, you know, and uh, you have, let's say, you know, 50 variables and they will create 2,000, 3,000, 10,000 predictors. And they run them through in order to get 0.000001% improvement, okay? That's really the thing, right? So they want, and they will run multiple algorithms, okay? They will run 10, 20, 30 different algorithms. It's called leaderboard. It's called leaderboard says who, who, who is the winner, right? So, and then the winning algorithm is the one that, you know, they will say, okay, I did it, right? And you know, the, I did, I won, or I did it the best, but the, you know, you know, there is a test data set on which you validate your answers, right? But it's crazy. The people are gone, have gone crazy with this machine learning stuff. You know, it's just nonsense. That's not how you make decisions, right? You don't really worry about 0.0001% improvement. You want to understand what the model is doing, how stable it is, right? And how will it do in the future on data sets that I haven't seen, right? So, so you know, I, I think, I think uh, there are lots of companies out there selling this stuff on this, uh, you know, automated, automated data, right? In you know, automating machine learning, automating AI. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Okay, I'm done. Shankaran, you have something? Yeah, one thing I, um, uh, uh, I, I would like to ask one thing regarding this pandemic situation. You mentioned about now casting technique. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you have any um, uh, uh, researchers come across, uh, have used this idea to predict the uh, this particular pandemic? Uh, when it will be over, something like that. What will be the? <laughs> no, no, no. Because now casting is a new idea. What you mentioned, a uh, right. lot of right. uh, scope for that. Any idea yeah, it's about? it's yeah. So Sankaran, it's been around for a while, right? The people call it bio surveillance, bio surveillance, okay. or syndromic surveillance, right? It's been around for 10, 15 years. Okay. And no, no, but uh, this uh, now we are using some machine learning like algorithms and other things uh, to predict yeah. that. We earlier uh, used some survival analysis techniques. Uh, eh? Are you? 
Are you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I have looked at the literature. I have a colleague of mine called uh, Brahma Mukherjee from Michigan. He, she's been very active in India in terms of predicting you know, we're dealing with the COVID data, right? So I, I can't really tell you much about it, but but we know we know that the data quality is very, very bad. You know that, right? Quality of data related to COVID, even in the US is very, very bad because of under-reporting and, and misreporting and time delays and all of this stuff, right? But the bigger thing is in all of this is, excuse me, uh, the government intervention, right? How people, how governments take actions, right? And a lot of that is driven by politics and economy, right? So, so that intervention varies from even state to state in India, I assume, right? So why did Kerala have, you know, in the beginning much lower and then later on higher, right? And why was that at the same time as let's say what was happening in Mumbai, right? Or Bangalore, Bengaluru for that matter, right? What was what was the difference? Right, right. It's it's all probably actions taken by the local government, and also how people were reacting to these things, right? And it's very hard to model those things, in my opinion, right? Because you know, my my take on this, and I'm not by any means an expert in this. My take on this is that uh, modeling pandemic or epidemic data often is useful after the fact. After it is over, you can go back and look at the data and you can do this and you can fit all kinds of epidemiology, epidemi, epi, epi models, look at you know, how it spreads over time, over space and all that, right? But many of the models that we have now, real time, they have not been very useful, right? We know that, right? They, have, they are just largely track can track what's going on, but they're not very good at predicting, right? Nobody predicts there's so many waves that we've had, right? Why, why were there so many waves, right? In the past, past epidemics have been two waves, but we've had three or four different waves lasting about two to three months, right? So anyway, I'm not an expert, Sangran. I'm, okay. just, I'm just pontificating here. So okay. it's, a, it's an interesting but hard problem, very hard problem, right? Data quality is big and it's just not about data because you're observing the effects of complex systems with you know feedback and feed forward kind of stuff, right? That's that's the problem in my opinion. So. Yeah. Hi. Uh, uh, hi. Uh, thank hi, you hi. for. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm Dr. Santosh. Uh, I belong hi. to the department of computer science here. Hi. Uh -huh. Hi. Hi. So, nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you for your very excellent talk, sir. So I have a very uh, maybe uh, it's not a question. It's a concern basically. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, uh, so definitely machine learning AI uh, requires huge amount of data as well as a huge amount of computation power. And uh, as we see, most of the companies like maybe Google or Microsoft or uh, Amazon are actually holding the huge amount of data as well as computation power. Right. So, so uh, maybe uh, how to democratize work in AI. So what is your uh, take on that? So democratize, by democratize, what, what do you mean, right? It, it, you know, I mean, I used the word democratize and I didn't really talk about it in any detail, but what is, what is, what would be your goal in democratize? You mean making data available and computing power available to academics, people yes. who are doing research, is that what you're saying? Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, so let's talk about making computing power available, right? That is a huge problem, right? And there is yeah. huge amounts of inequity, even in the US between the rich universities and the not so rich universities, right? You know, uh, so that is a problem. And of course, you know, universities, yeah. universities in, you know, in different, in different parts of the world, I mean, you, know, you can imagine, I mean, I imagine you're talking about you know, what's happening in India. And even in India, the IITs probably have a lot more funding than others. Although you guys are probably pretty pretty well off compared to the small colleges, right? I don't have a good answer to that, Dr. Santosh, right? I don't really have a good answer, right? You know, uh, the data is probably a more doable problem, right? And, uh, you know, because data are now becoming, for example, the COVID data is at least in the US is available and collected by CDC 
and there are Johns Hopkins at, at the university that's available, right? You can download it, you can play around with it, right? And then there are lots of more, you know, social media data, for example, Twitter data and stuff like that. You can actually get access, get access to that, right? You know, I mean, you know, uh, for example, Google, you know, Google citation data, for example, that's available, right? So there are lots and lots of data that is available. And, you know, if you want to just play around with it, get a feel for it and do some modeling, right? And, and get your, you know, and teach for teaching purposes and so on learning purposes. Now, if you want to do real-time decision-making and getting involved in that, then you have to start working and collaborating with these companies, right? And that's harder, right? But I, my son-in-law, for example, works with Amazon, right? He's, he's a, what they call an Amazon scholar. And he's involved in lots and lots of problems, but it's all highly proprietary data. They won't, he, won't, he can't even tell me what the problem is, problems is working on, right? So, so, you know, you can understand. I mean, I, now that I'm in Wells Fargo, I had a request from a colleague of mine, at uh, a friend of mine at the University of Georgia to send some data for their capstone projects, right? But, but for me, even to send data that is not that important, I have to clean it, sanitize it, get it cleared. It's a lot of work. And I told him, look, I just don't have that kind of time, right? I wish, I wish I, we can go around and share a lot of data. Uh, you know, I would say 80% of the data that we have can be shared, you know? by simply removing the labels, doing some transformations, right? But companies are paranoid. You know, what can you do, right? I mean, that's, and that's the world I live in right now, par paranoia. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, Dr. Santosh. Please, please, connect, please connect with me so we can have this conversation. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just wanted okay. to add on with the Vijay sir's comment. Um, there are some data that are available publicly in Canada. So due to COVID, um, it's not patient level, but still uh, the COVID reports are there in Canadian um, citizenship uh, government side. So if you go there, you can get the data. But only problem is, or I would say caveat, is that like uh, some of the um, provinces, uh, we call it as like instead state provinces, some of the provinces are like uh, underreported, but mostly um, Ontario and British Columbia and Quebec are the three provinces you can see really great data. And mm -hmm. another one is like a Canadian Institute of uh, Health Information. They have publicly available annual aggregated data for most of the sectors. It's again related to um, health science. Then mm -hmm. are there another uh, ways you can uh, pay two hundred dollars or two fifty dollars uh, to write MDS? Um, it's one time access, but you can get the data till date based on any area you are looking for at the patient level, including insurance data that they claimed on. So um, TransUnion also charged two hundred dollars. So it's one time access, you can get any type of data, including your insurance claim or just like a car insurance claim, any kind of risk. Again, I wanted to add one more part since I'm working in that field, they're just giving you the problem with the um, data access. Nowadays, everybody is really careful about data privacy and security. And at the back, and there is a risk assessment that we conduct uh, how to give uh, public access to certain data. So if you ask a public access, there is like a risk assessment, which is the whole process, including the lawyers. We incorporate everyone and get the access publicly. If even when you pay $200, there is just like a back end. There are lots of work going on to give that access for the research purpose, even in academic. Sorry, sorry. No, no, no. It was very, very useful, very interesting to you know. But, you know, I think, Bala, since you are president of ISPS, right, I'm wondering whether there should be an effort at a professional society levels to identify and gather data sets and have repositories of data, right? So, you know, that way you, researchers can, can use that, right? And Dr. Santosh, I forgot, University of Michigan has an organization that they call ICPSR, uh, Interna In International Consortium on something or other, they have lots and lots of public data, okay? And that's available, 
that's available for researchers. So if you would like to get access to that, yeah, you can contact me, connect with me, and I will connect you with some researchers there, right? But I think this is a very good point that you have raised, and that is a lot of people who are struggling, and, and there is a lot of individuals putting effort, right, Shano, and along the lines of you talked about. If you know if people can actually uh, develop a repositories of data for research purposes, and maybe some some kind of research uh, you know organizations like NSF or something in India can set this up. That way, data can be shared and used, and people can actually uh, you know do do good research this way. Yeah, that's a good good point, Shano. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think. Uh, Hello, sir. I am. Yeah. 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 Hello, sir. I'm Smita, research scholar from Karnataka. Thank mm -hmm. you for the insightful session. My question is regarding the topic of interpretable AI that you mentioned and the bias and uh, variance mm -hmm. trade off. Mm -hmm. So, basically, these, when we design a machine learning model, we ensure to find the right hyperparameters that can give us the best result. So right. what, what way can we justify that this is the set of hyperparameters that has given us, or is there any other way apart from the interpretable AI, which can tell us or help us to find the combination of the hyperparameters? Well, that's a really good question, Smita. Uh, I think, I think the, the way people look at uh, machine learning algorithms, right? Unlike, unlike in statistics, uh, where people do look at bias and variance and mean squared error and all of that, all of that stuff, or prediction error, right? What they do is, as you know, there is a holdout data set. You you have a data set, you split it into training data set, uh, validation data set used for uh, uh, hyperparameter tuning, and then there is a test data set. Right, and that name validation and test data is often confused, but regardless, then you develop, you train an algorithm, you optimize it, and then you look at it, its performance on test data set, right? And often the test data set performance is smaller than what you get in training data set, because training data set overfits. Uh, on the training data set, the model overfits. So you think that, A, you know, on the test data set, it's an idea of generalizability. You have held out my, uh, my, this data set. My algorithm has never seen that data. How well does it on, this, on my training data set, right? That's a test data set, sorry. But as you said, there are a whole bunch of other considerations here, right? One is, uh, is my algorithm robust? So what we do, for example, is we take the data set, we, uh, we perturb it, we change it slow, uh, slightly, and then we see if our model performance changes a lot. We look at our algorithm and we look at areas where the model is not fitting well, and then we see if uh, the areas, the, the, model, the model weakness, what is the cost of the model weakness, right? So we look at all of those other diagnostics and interpretability is another important one because you look at the interpretability and you say, hey, this input output relationship, it makes sense, right? And then it said, this doesn't make sense, right? So that is another one, as you, as you said. So you got to look at a combination of these assessments before you're happy with the model. In particular, it's a model that is very important and it's gonna affect a lot of people. And this is what we do when it's credit decisions. People are asking for loans and we don't give somebody a loan. Uh, that is that's a big deal for the customer, right? So that is under a lot of scrutiny, right? So that's the way, these are some other ways to do it. Sumita, I hope I answered your question. Yes, yes, thank you, sir. So basically we would uh, justify it uh, through an empirical analysis that this model can give a stable result along with the interpretability. So Correct. that is, that, that is the, yes, thank yeah, you. Yeah, but, but there are no, 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 you know, there's a lot of work still going on, you know, nobody really knows what is right, you know, still yes, a very yes. evolving area. Yes, yes, okay. yes, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think, thank you. Thank you all for your active participation. So, Vijay, thank you. Thank you very much. Very, now, I just invite our uh, head of the program, Dr. Rajesh, to uh, express out of thanks formally. I think you, uh, Raj, you have not met Rajesh. He has joined uh, maybe about five years ago, the department. Now he's oh, in the right. department. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, hi, Rajesh. Hello. Yeah, Rajesh. Hello. Hi, thanks, sir. Dr. Can't hear you, Rajesh. Can't hear you. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Ken Mansur.
respected pro vice chancellor pg shankaran our chief guest professor vijay nair sir uh, all the participants attended the program uh, it was a wonderful uh, evening for us by hearing your informative talk it gives uh, deep insight in the topic and how the statistical methods are closely related with the, the machine learning and all the uh, new topics uh, the university is celebrating its 50th anniversary and our department statistics department is celebrating its 25th anniversary uh, also we started a new course on data science and uh, data science and analytics on this occasion we are honored by uh, your presence virtual presence sir now i am moving on, moving on to my duty Uh, first of all i would like to thank professor ken vasudharan sir for giving us all support to conduct this program thank you sir now i extend our sincere thanks to pro vice chancellor pg shankaran thank you sir uh, now i uh, extend our sincere gratitude to professor vijay sir uh, for giving a valuable talk uh, for our students and our teachers thank you sir once again Thank you very much. I really appreciate the invitation. I'm honored to be part of your university celebration. Thank you so much, and I hope within a year we can I can make a visit. I can make a visit and see you all. Come to university. You can come to university. Now, excellent thing. Thanks to Professor Barishna, whose effort to make this event very success. Thank you, sir. Finally, I extend our sincere thanks to all the participants. The person virtually present here. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. Bye.